Hello everyone, my name is Sasha Black. I am a competition winning and best-selling indie author, an author of non-fiction writing craft books and young adult fantasy. I'm also a writing consultant and a developmental editor. And I also happen to be the Alliance of Independent Authors conference manager and blog manager. My presentation today is all about how to write a hero who sells your book. Writing a book is easy, but writing a good book is really hard. There's a lot to get right, so it takes more than just slapping out some words in a fury of word vomit and chucking in a battle scene or sprinkling a handful of damsel saving heroes over your story to impress a reader. Throughout my career, I've seen a number of manuscripts and the things that I tend to see most with heroes are four common errors. A lack of objectivity, no depth, no growth, or a failure to connect. I'll elaborate on each of these now. Number one, a lack of objectivity. Okay, I'm going to make a wild accusation and say that writers are hero worshippers. I mean, let's be honest, we've all had moments where we want to shower more unconditional love on our heroes than on our toddlers. I know I've been there. I know what it's like when you're in the depths of word vomit and you just have to finish this scene with your hero. But loving a character that much usually results in a lack of objectivity, in the same way that we go blind to our manuscripts and our stories. It's not that we don't want to see the errors or the gross indulgences in our heroes, it's that we can't. We're so deep into hero worship that wading out to objectivity land is impossible. Number two, no depth. Writers fall prey to showering positive traits on their heroes because, well, the hero saves the day. How, how could my uh, dapper knight possibly have any negative traits? Well, because, darling, he's human. Or at least a pen and ink shaped version of a human. The point is, you want your reader to feel like your hero is a human and humans are not perfect. A lack of depth or one-dimensional heroes can be caused by a variety of things, but most commonly because they, your hero has an overwhelmingly positive personality, or he never makes a mistake. Perhaps your hero's personality fails to be a consequence of his history. Humans are products of their history, and not being a product of your history can create an uneasy feeling in your readers. And last, if your hero doesn't actively drive your plot forward, you'll create a disconnect. Number three, no growth. Story is change. In this context, growth is another word for change. In novel terms, your hero is the explanatory mechanism for that change. It's the story of your hero's development and change that readers come for. Of course, not every story has to have the protagonist experience change directly. For example, if you write dystopian fiction, the crumbling of society could represent that change. And a great example of that is Katniss from The Hunger Games. Her personality doesn't actually change in any of the novels, but she affects change on her world. Number four, a lack of connection. A lack of connection can be split into two, a disconnect with the audience or a disconnect with the other characters in the story. Let's start with a disconnect with the audience. There are many things that make your readers connect or not to your story. And your characters in particular, such as how relatable they are, how gripping the plot twists are, and the pace and tension in your novel, help your reader to care about your protagonist. Of course, creating just the right literary cocktail to connect to your audience is tantamount to eating a gourmet meal in the dark, Half the time, your fork misses the plate, let alone the food, 
and the rest of the time you're trying to work out if you just ate Cheerios or octopus tentacles. Creating the connection between the reader and the hero is a balancing act, but the authors who really achieve it are those that ensure the hero is a manifestation of your book's theme. And yes, I know theme is controversial. Not everyone wants their book to be saying something. Not everyone even knows what their stories are about until they've written them. That's fine, guys. No one's asking you to be philosophical about this. Your theme could be just as simple as a single word. Let's go back to the Hunger Games. Suzanne Collins chose the theme Sacrifice, and Katniss, the protagonist, embodies that fully. It's all connected, and when it's connected, your readers connect with it too. The second part of disconnection is a is more internal. It's with the stories and the uh, it's with the story and the characters within it. All too often, writers create their hero in isolation. The hero is the most important character. Of course we should give him our sole focus, right? Wrong. Your novel is a spider's web. Let me explain. When a protagonist is created in isolation from the other characters and the theme, it leads to an excess of one dimensionality. When a spider weaves a web and every strand in that web is connected, there might be several hundred threads but they all wind and weave their way towards that central knot in the middle, touching at key points to create web stability. Each thread is dependent on the others to create a complete web. Your hero and supporting characters should do the same. Each character should be a reflection of the others and the others a reflection of the theme. By comparing each character to the others, you're able to see how they are similar, but also how they differ, meaning you can distinguish and define the characters with more clarity, which creates depth and three dimensions. Let's keep going with the web of connectivity. In a finished book, each part, the characters, the theme, the twists, the arc and the subplots are all seamlessly woven together. In a way, a spider's web is a feat of engineering gestaltism. And gestalt means the whole is more than the sum of its parts. Each thread is woven separately, but connected to the others up close, it looks like a mass of patterned lines and ang angles, but stand back and you can see the full picture. A web, or a spidery net, which is capable of trapping food. Something that's more than just the lines of the silky string. This is what your book is. It's what your hero is. An expression of everything else the vehicle by which your readers are forced to stand back and admire your story web. Everything, and I do mean everything, is connected. But how does it all connect? You have a theme which poses a thematic question. Your hero is the positive embodiment of the theme. Your villain is the negative embodiment of the anti-theme. Throughout the course of your story, you must answer the thematic question. Your villain, as the negative expression of your theme, must prevent the hero from answering that question. Your hero starts the story flawed and therefore on the wrong side of the theme. As a result, she believes a lie and is unable to answer that theme question. She'll face challenges and obstacles throughout the plot based on the theme. In other words, your key events and plot points. This forces her to make choices based on the theme in order to defeat the obstacles. Other characters help or hinder her, each playing a different functional role based on the theme. They could be providing information 
or playing the role of moral conscience, or that lack thereof. They could act as an ally or a foe. These experiences and choices and obstacles shape your hero, eventually causing her to change. The change in your hero enables her to see through the lie that she believed, which ultimately pushes her back over the right side of the moral and thematic line, and therefore here completeth her character arc. The change means that she can find the strength, or, you know, the sword of destiny that she needs to defeat the villain. Therefore, a huge battle, be it literal, metaphorical or philosophical, will commence, and ultimately your villain's doom. Your hero defeats the villain and can answer the thematic and moral question. (sighs) Glorious, isn't it? Everything is connected. Each character, whether minor or major, is an expression of the theme or the moral dilemma your hero is faced with. Each character's personality should be carefully woven to portray another version of the choice your hero has to make, or as an expression of the theme. Obstacles and plot points should be created to test the hero on the theme or thematic question. And in the end, the hero will spiral to one inevitable concluding thematic answer. Let's put this into practice with an example. Planes, the Disney movie. Now, I love Disney movies because they always, without fail, have an unbelievably brilliant web of story connectivity. They're designed for kiddies, which means they simplify down the theme, the moral action and the character traits into simple components. And I do tend to use them as examples because when it's this simple, it's easy to follow the web through to completion. Okay, for those who haven't uh, seen Planes, here's a quick plot summary. Dusty is a small town plane whose purpose is to dust the local farmer's crops. However... Dusty dreams of a bigger life as a racer. With help from an ex-fighter plane, Dusty qualifies for the biggest race in the world. The film then follows Dusty as he overcomes various obstacles to win the race. So let's look at Dusty's web of connectivity. The theme of planes, in its simplest form, is courage. But it's more than that. One of the minor characters, Franz, conveys the theme in dialogue. Thanks from all of us that want to do more than what we were just built for. That's what he says, and that's what conveys the theme. Now, conveying the theme in dialogue is quite a basic technique. It kind of punches the reader in the face with the theme, and, you know, that's not so good for future sales. But of course, this is for children. And so in that instance, it's okay. Dusty, the hero, wants to be more than he is, which is a representation of the theme, which means the moral action he takes must must lead him to become more than he is. But how does this link to his traits? Well, Dusty's positive traits are courage and determination. Dusty's obstacles throughout the film are a fear of heights, he's too trusting, and his enemy is Ripslinger, a plane hell-bent on winning. The only way Dusty can win the race and become a full-time racer, which, going back to the theme, is more than he was built for, is to get over his biggest fear and fly higher than any of the other racers. His traits are perfectly set up to enable him to do that. He has the courage to overcome his fear. And when he repeatedly fails to fly high enough in practice sessions, it's his other trait, determination, that pushes him through to keep going and eventually overcome his obstacle and fear. Ripslinger, the antagonist, refuses to change throughout the story and maintains the anti-theme. 
He believes that you can only be what you are made for. And Ripslinger embodies that by being inflexible, but that also means he's predictable. Ultimately, Dusty uses Ripslinger's habitual race behaviour to predict what he will do, resulting in Dusty being able to outmanoeuvre Ripslinger and win the race. But he's only able to do that if he overcomes his fear of heights and flies higher than ever before. I love the web of connectivity and I think if you can do it and put it into your novel, you are well on track for a bestseller. Let's move on. Crafting conflict. When you break conflict down into its itty bitty components, it really is as simple as A plus B equals C or the existence of a goal and prevention of the goal being achieved equates to conflict. That's it. Create a goal, stop the goal from coming to fruition. There are two questions I like to keep in mind when trying to create conflict in my stories. Number one, what's your hero's goal? And number two, what are you going to do to stop her from getting it? I'm going to give you a whistle-stop set of tips for creating conflict. Let's start with specificity. Conflict has to be specific to both the hero and the villain in order to get them to be invested in fighting each other. It needs to mean something to them both equally. It should also be linked to their values and heightened by their emotions. But to really hammer the nail in the connectivity coffin, make sure that you connect the conflict to the theme. For example, in G.I. Jane, which is a very cool movie, by the way, the major theme was female power. This is why much of the conflict was based on sexism and reducing her power, specifically males reducing her female power. And her fight was triumphing, triumphing, that's easy for me to say, as a powerful woman. It's all connected. Okay, types of conflict. I think there are three main types of conflict. Macro, micro and inner. I'll break those down a little more. Macro conflict. This is a large scale type of conflict. Think about world wars or society against the hero, or I should say the hero against society. Typically, you can find this in dystopian novels. Uh, Katniss and the Hunger Games being a perfect example of this. Also, another one would be Day of the Triffids. If you've watched, watched, read that classic book by John Wyndham. The next one is micro conflict. This is a more interpersonal form of conflict. The battle the hero has with personal relationships, for example, between lovers in a romance book, or between friends or family, colleagues and enemies. The last type of conflict is inner conflict. This is the smallest unit of conflict, as it's internal only to the hero. It's the conflict the hero has with his own flaws, emotions and values. But... While it is the most isolated type of conflict, it's usually the most heart-wrenching for the reader because it's the conflict that is derived from the hero himself. This is particularly true if you write in closer points of views like, like the first person or the third person limited. Now, as cheesy as it sounds, balance is the key to life. And that's the same for conflict. And you know what's boring? Monotony. Conflict is best served layered, like cake. And I love cake. And I'm pretty sure your readers love cake too. Conflict and flaws. Conflict could, in theory, be about a number of topics. But the cleverest types of conflict are designed to make the hero confront his flaw. It's that moment where I reach across the interweb, grab my web, my spiders, I hate spiders, but I'm going to grab my spiders web just for you and fling it at everybody, grinning, 
If you connect conflict to the theme, to your protagonist's flaw, then you get a web of bookish beauty and connectivity. I mentioned the Disney movie Planes earlier. Dusty, the protagonist's the, the protagonist's major flaw is that he's afraid of heights. To win the race, the major conflict, Dusty must confront his flaw directly. The only way he can win is to go above the clouds and go higher than he's ever been before, thus forcing him to face his flaw and overcome it in order to achieve his goal of winning. But how do you create conflict? I can't possibly list all of the types of conflict here. Well, well, I well I could, but it would take forever and it would be the entire presentation and you'd probably get really bored, so I'm not going to. Instead, I'll give you a couple of examples of each. Okay, in a conflict. Wounds are a fantastic way of creating conflict and they actually serve uh, all, all three types of conflict. Wars are started about disagreements between people and those disagreements can come from a hero or a character's wound. I liken a wound to a scar. So ask yourself what scars are in your hero's past? Maybe his family was murdered or he lost a limb in war or perhaps he went through a traumatic divorce or maybe he failed to save his little sister and now the person that caused her death has come back into his life. These kinds of wounds impact a person's life, and they're the kind of thing that a man will go to war over, which is why they create such good conflict. And what about fear? There are a million different ways a person can feel fear, and fear is a stop action. If a person is afraid, it will stop them from progressing. It will stop your hero from moving through your story. An excellent obstacle. And it also becomes the book's uh, main question. Can your hero overcome their fear in order to achieve their goal? How much does your hero want it? How much is your, your hero willing to sacrifice in order to get it? What about love? Love is the age old cause of war. Philosophers will tell you that love is the only thing worth fighting for. And it's certainly something your characters will fight for. And last for inner conflict are values. I've mentioned this a little bit before. But values reveal our deepest held beliefs. And this often tells you a lot about a person or your character. Which is why when another character challenges your hero, like a villain or an antagonist, it will create excellent conflict. Moving on to micro-conflict. Family. Oh, family. The beautiful rose covered in thorns. I love my family dearly. But there's something universal about the love-hate relationship we have with our families. And that, my darlings, can create fabulous conflict. Secrets. Secrets are pesky little things. Most commonly, they create conflict at the inner and micro levels. What about competition? Competitiveness. That secret sin we all profess not to have. Liars, all of you. Deep down, we are all wired to want to win. It's science, survival of the fittest. Darwin said so. Macro conflict. Macro conflict is like rolling out the big guns of world ending conflict. Instead of focusing on people and inner battles, this conflict will span worlds, generations and societies. It's the big bad society with no face, which is why suggestion number one is the government and or society. Number two, religion. In the same way that values are extremely close to a person's sense of identity, so is religion. And we all know that there have been many wars in real life fought over religion and over religious conflicts. Power struggles. Okay, I'm going to be philosophical. I'm going to be philosophical for a second. And maybe controversial. Power is recognised as desirable. It's accepted by readers worldwide as a realistic cause for conflict. Your villain wants power to do things. But 
Often, a mistake writers make is they leave out the reason why they want that power. There must be a reason, whether it's to create armies, control a sector of society, or just to seek revenge. But if you think about it, even those aren't the real reason one goes after power. It comes back to your theme. What are your personal values? What is your personal philosophy? philosophy as an author. Why, at the core of your villain or your hero's desire, do they want the power? Why are they willing to fight for it? Impossible odds. Odds are impossible for a reason. It's difficult to make a perilous journey to... uh, to There's me tripping over my tongue. It's impossible to make a perilous journey to retrieve a specific item, a bit like Indiana Jones. Or what about Apollo in the Rock, uh, Apollo Creed in the Rocky movie? <clears throat> they have a big fight and it's impossible to beat his enemy. Anything that's difficult creates conflict for several reasons. The two most popular reasons are because decisions are required over how to achieve their goal. The concept of impossible odds when broken down is really about winning something, whether that's power, respect or a boxing belt. From success comes disaster. I love anything that twists the expected into something unexpected. Turning what your hero thought would be a success on its head is a way to do this. For example, Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. Victor creates Frankenstein, but instead of being happy and overjoyed, he's actually sickened by his creation. Jurassic World is another classic example of this. I mean, really? Bringing back the man-eating, world-destroying dinosaurs and what, hope for the best? That was never going to be a good idea, was it? However, it created awesome conflict. Emotion. Emotions drive humans. We feel our way through life, hurting and loving and caring and hating. It's the age-old adage, head over heart. Or is it heart over head? In either case. What we do when our emotions butt up against someone else's can cause problems and conflict. The hero lens. What is a hero lens? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to tell you. Your hero is a bookish telescope. A strangely muscular uh, flannel? No, he is not. He is a funnel. A dashing mirror. A pair of protagonist-shaped glasses. A cape-swishing magnifying glass. Okay, I'll stop. All those things are lenses in one form or another. Your hero is the lens through which your reader experiences your novel. Everything the hero does, sees, feels and thinks, encloses your reader into a tiny literary lens. Nothing happens in your book unless your protagonist experiences it. Everything is channeled through her. She is the lens your reader looks through when reading your story. Readers want this lens. They covet it. But that means your lens needs to be tinted in a slightly different colour to everyone else's. The thing I hear most from writers is how difficult it is to get your reader to know your hero implicitly without using exposition, uh, whether that be in dialogue or description. How do you get your readers and your audience to hear the hero's voice rather than yours as the author? It's at this point I'll tell you, it really doesn't matter what traits you use for your hero. It's not the traits and motivations that make them unique, it's the way they embody them. The expression of those traits will impact how she experiences the world. For example, let's say you have identical twins. One is a meat eater and one is vegetarian. Why can roast chicken smell like thick and creamy deliciousness to one twin and like sour flesh to the other? The implicit hero shows the reader your story through the five, through his or her five senses. How does the world look, sound, feel or taste to her? It's the expression of these senses that creates subtle nuances. 
The hero's lens is made up of four parts. Actions, thoughts, dialogue and feelings. These four are wholly unique to your character and to your character's personality. Uh, sorry, and your character's personality should be reflected through them. I ask this question all of the time because it's such a good one. Is turquoise more blue or more green? The answer is actually irrelevant. But what I can assure you is this. Half of you listening will have said blue and the other half green. Understanding why it is that you see things differently to everyone else will help you understand what makes your viewpoint and ultimately your heroes unique. What's key here is the way your protagonist describes her experiences. The metaphor and descriptor choices will tell the reader about their personality. It creates nuances and quirks that separate one hero from another. It also demonstrates those traits in action. For example, an angry hero might see a town parade like this. The villagers weave through the streets, brandishing placards like rifles. Their soldiers marching into their last battle. The war drum beat of their feet grinds into my ears, rattling my teeth and making my blood boil. But a depressed hero might see the same town parade like this. They move like a current each person flowing past the next, supposedly united in their cause. But as they chant and sing for solidarity, it sounds like a melody of mourners. I see the tiny fractures, the gaps they leave between each other, the scattered looks, the fear of isolation. Each of them is drowning in a swelling crowd, and yet, despite the mass of bodies, they're all fighting alone. In both of those examples, I haven't used either the word angry or depressed, and yet those emotions are implicit in the paragraphs. Why? Well, because of the hero lens. Each protagonist experiences the same event, and yet they hear and see different things. How the character sees the world, how they feel or smell or taste, combined with their traits and experiences, creates these distinctions between characters. It's down to the word choices and the metaphors. Imbuing your hero's descriptions with their unique sense of personality will give your hero depth and make them sparkle on the page. And that's it. We are at the end of how to create a hero who will sell your books. If you'd like more information or more detailed descriptions about how to do this, then you can uh, have a look at my books. The first one is How to Craft a Kick-Ass Protagonist, 10 Steps to Hero, or 13 Steps to Evil, How to Craft Super Bad Villains. Both are available everywhere books are sold. I also run a blog for writers at www.sashablack.co.uk. I also have a podcast, which you should be able to find on any podcast catcher, and it is called The Rebel Author Podcast. And last, I have a Facebook group where we do weekly accountability posts and talk about all things craft, marketing, publishing, and all of that jazz. And if you search for 13 Steps to Evil, you should, on Facebook, you should be able to find it. So thank you very much, everybody, and I hope you enjoyed my presentation.